Well, here to break it all down, CBSN political contributor and Republican strategist Leslie Sanchez, and in Washington, CBS News senior political editor Steve Shigaris. Uh, so, Steve, uh, to you first. Reince Priebus said yesterday that people just don't care about stories like the one we just referenced. Do you agree with the RNC chair? I guess we'll find out, right? I mean, we don't know. We don't, do they not care? I, we're writing about them. We're talking about them. Uh, I mean, I would guess that some voters care about this stuff. But the question is, is what, what are the lingering effects? I mean, you look at the, this story about, about women, uh, Trump, uh, there's a poll, there are po there's polling out there that shows that he has high unfavorables among women. And can these stories help or hurt that? We'll, we'll find out in the long run. Uh, they can't, I can't imagine they're going to help very much. Um, but again, we're also five and a half months before the election. There's a lot that's going to happen between now and November. Uh, and you can't just look at this in a vacuum. I mean, uh, Trump is going to go hard against Hillary Clinton uh, and how uh, she handled uh, her husband's uh, uh, problems uh, when he was president. Uh, that, that's going to have an effect on how women voters view both of these candidates. So again, these kinds of stories don't necessarily help. But at the same time, what kind of long-term negative effect? It's just really hard to say at this point. I'm a little skeptical that they will have long-term negative effects given what we've seen uh, involving Trump uh, and negative stories over the last year. Uh, uh, to Steve's point, Leslie, uh, Trump's unfavorables with women are sky high. Uh, Mitt Romney won something like 14 percent of the white women vote back in 2012, and he still lost the election. So we're talking about a group of people, uh, you know, a, a, a segment of society that Mr. Trump is already starting out behind the eight ball, so to speak. Right, right. He needs to gain those voters. What women want is a, is a candidate who respects them. Let's just start with that. And it, there, what's important to remember here is the women's vote is a swing vote in the sense that independent women, and to some extent some married women, do move back and forth. And it's that elusive sector. If you think about right after 9-11, they were the 2004, 2008, they were the security moms. After that, it was the economic downturn. It was the, econ it was the Walmart moms who had the cross pressures and were personalizing the downward economy. Now we're seeing a resurgence because of all of the, the rise of ISIS of, and these beheadings and these you know atrocities of these security moms again. So there's a perfect storm to create an alliance of women who are, want a brash style, want strong leadership. But what Trump is doing is completely miscalculating how important this this vote is and how they can shun this kind of disrespectful statements over a longer period of time. It's not the past indiscretions. It's the current kind of uh, uh, misplacement of words. There's right. no women within his organization that are really strong, leadership-oriented women that can counterbalance what seems like a nonsensical, nonsensical bully in a schoolyard. And mm. that's where the optics of what he's saying, but the alignment of what they want are not matching up. Steve, uh, some of the, you know, and this is what most analysts, uh, analysts are saying, is that uh, Trump, when it comes to controversies like this, it's not going to affect the people that are supporting him. But, mm -hmm. but we've talked a lot about the difference between a primary race and now a general election race. And so when you understand, or when people see that Mitt Romney got in trouble for saying binders full of women, that seemed to be a big deal for him, still did very well with white women. But now we've got all these other things brewing here with Trump uh, in a general election race. How do you think it's going to be perceived? Well, that's the question. I and mean, we, again, we can't look at this story and these things in a vacuum with just Trump. It's Trump versus Clinton now, right? So how do women view Hillary Clinton? How are women, independent women, how are Democratic and Republican women going to view Hillary Clinton? Are they going to come out in droves for her just because she's a woman? Or are they going to look at her as somebody uh, that has some negatives attached to her? Again, her overall unfavorables are not that much lower than Trump's. And so that's going to be the question moving forward. As I was pointing out with the story, these kinds of things don't help Trump move on from from issues that he's having uh, with women voters. But at the same time, we have a long time between now and November. He does have an opportunity to try to change, uh, change people's opinions. Uh, to Leslie's point, where are the strong women in, in his campaign that are going to help him sort of get on the right track with that? You point to uh, his wife and you can point to his daughter who are both you know, involved and he mentions a lot, but are they strong enough? Where is his sort of Karen Hughes to uh, George W. Bush? Where is his Beth Myers to Mitt Romney? There's no person within his campaign, no woman within his campaign that can sort of help him right the ship. Uh, and so whether it's family that can help him do that or whether he can even do it at all, that's going to be a big question moving forward as well. All right, let's turn now to another brewing controversy. Uh, Donald Trump is going after Prime Minister David Cameron after he criticized him for his proposed Muslim ban. Let's listen and I'll get both of you to respond on the other side. The British Prime Minister David Cameron recently said he stands by his comments 
that your position on Muslims was stupid, divisive, and wrong. Yeah. He, he wouldn't retract them, and he wouldn't apologize for saying I, I, that. Honestly, I don't care. It doesn't matter. I mean, it's fine. Um, but if you're president, and he's the British prime minister. It looks like we're not going to have a very good relationship. Who knows? I hope to have a good relationship with him. But it sounds like he's not willing to address the problem either. Not going to have a very good relationship with Britain, with the United Kingdom, Steve. Uh, your take, this, this kind of feuding with foreign leaders, even before uh, he gets anywhere near the Oval Office. Well, again, th this is playing into at least what his supporters like about him, which is this tough talk, whether it's against uh, David Cameron or other foreign leaders. Uh, I mean, I do have to point out there are n there's nobody in the United Kingdom that's going to be voting in this election in, in the fall. So <laughs> he's not really risking uh, alienating voters. However, at least, you know, speaking specifically about Cameron, I don't think. I mean, I, maybe there are people in this country who are looking at this and saying, uh, and they would never vote for Trump anyway. I don't like the way he's going to deal with foreign policy. He scares me. You heard Bob Gates over the weekend say there's some scary things uh, that Trump uh, would do in terms of foreign policy. Um, but there are a lot of people also that want to see somebody, an outsider, come in, anti-establishment, shake things up, and that's talking tough about all these folks uh, overseas. And so, again, there's five and a half months between now and November. Uh, do we think that his tough talk against David Cameron in May is going to have an effect on what people think in November? I don't think so. Uh, but at the same time, uh, this fuels the fire of people who already don't like Donald Trump and who are already scared about Trump and how he would handle foreign policy moving forward. And if he's going to alienate our friends, then who knows how he's going to deal with uh, our enemies, right? Leslie? I think, I think Steve's exactly right on this point. I mean, we can say, oh, we're so far away, it's really not going to make an impact right now, but it's a distraction. It's a war of words with our greatest ally. Like, what? don't you want to reserve that for your enemies? Yeah. In context, it just shows poor judgment. And it goes back to our previous point. Does he have people within the campaign who can slow him as he's making the, you know, making the corners so he doesn't crash into the wall? And it doesn't seem that way. Right. It's this constant kind of like, he speaks off the cuff. In most cases, that's fine. Fine, but here it's completely misplaced. Off the cuff is okay, I guess, and and that perhaps as Steve points out, that's what his supporters are looking for. But when you hear that he wants to allow Japan and Korea to have nuclear weapons, that it, you know perhaps we're not going to have a good relationship with Britain. Um, it almost and and what you see now, I think we're starting to see, which is really interesting for the Republican Party, that many people who are involved in national security are right. the ones that are not so much on the fence as they are saying, look, I don't think that Mr. Trump represents the kind of person that we want representing the United States abroad when it comes to dealing with these very important issues, when it comes to dealing with ISIS, when it comes to dealing with Saudi Arabia, for example. He doesn't seem to have that those chops to be able to do that. Right. You it's may not, have a lot of people like Paul Ryan saying, I'm on the fence, but when it comes to right. people like Robert Gates saying, it sounds to me like Robert Gates is probably not going to come around to endorsing Donald sure. Trump. Sure, and you could counter that with Dick Cheney, who came forward and said, you know, hello, mastermind there in terms of right. national security, <laughs> call it whatever you li like it or dislike it, pro-defense. Pro who, who stood by him. Here's the question. That narrative can stick. Hillary Clinton's campaign has already started to see that, you know, it's some, it, it, in the way she's talking about kind of his, his again, misjudgment. You can have a brash leadership style, but mm -hmm. you can't be kind of off the rails. And that's why, can he have a measured approach? Can he be burst of like this bombastic style, but still show that he takes these issues seriously? And right now, I think there's a lot of people, including myself, who are starting to question whether or not he can have that kind of control. Great conversation. Would love to keep it going. Uh, unfortunately, got to move on. Leslie Sanchez, thank Steve Shigaris, thank you both very much. Appreciate it. Thanks.